All right. Good afternoon and welcome back to our next session. And coming up with us as a talk with Kathy Leaders. Our exclusive uh, sponsor for the session is a full day sponsor, Northrop Grumman. And I'd like to introduce somebody that probably has more business cards with different organizations on it than I, you and I have. And that's Frank Tomorrow. Frank is the vice president and general manager of Tactical Space Systems at Northrop Grumman Space Systems. Frank, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alan, and good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, as Alan said, I represent Northrop Grumman, and we're proud to sponsor today's proceedings. So, you know, at Northrop Grumman, we are building on our mission heritage with innovative technologies to enable NASA to return humans to the moon in, in support of their ultimate goal of return of getting humans to Mars. And of course, we're currently supporting the HALO module, which will be part of the Lunar Gateway. And we're proud to be part of the national team of Blue Origin and Lockheed Martin on the uh, human landing system. Uh, today, I have the honor to introduce Kathy Leader, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, who's leading the agency in achieving this goal. And Kathy began her NASA career at the White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico, where she was the Shuttle Orbiting Maneuvering System and Reaction Control System Depot Manager. Uh, she later moved to the International Space Station Program and served as the Transportation Integration Manager where she led commercial cargo resupply services to the space station. Kathy was also responsible for NASA's oversight of the international partner spacecraft visiting the space station, including the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle, JAXA's H2 transfer vehicle, and the Russian Space Agency's Soyuz and Progress vehicle. And in her most recent role, Kathy directed NASA's efforts to send astronauts to space on private spacecraft, which has culminated in the successful launch of Demo-2 from the Kennedy Space Center in May, and everyone's excited about the next mission, the Crew-1 mission, uh, which will take place in November. Now, I have the pri privilege of working with Kathy when she was in that transportation integration office um, as one of the providers of the commercial cargo services. And Kathy and I worked very closely together in developing the Cygnus vehicle. And when we look back on that, uh, the Northrop Grumman 14 mission, which of course includes the legacy work from Orbital ATK and Orbital Sciences Corporation, uh, NG-14 is currently on the International Space Station. We just recently delivered about 8,000 pounds of cargo. But when we look back at the entire program, on the Northrop Grumman side, we've delivered more than 80,000 pounds of cargo to the International Space Station, including supplies and, of course, science for the, uh, for the crew to conduct on the, uh, on the mission. And so Kathy's leadership and vision in making that program a success has just been uh, really inspirational and uh, really led the way for a lot of the things that are going on now be beyond commercial cargo. And I think really changed the way NASA approached the uh, acquisition of those services. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll say about it is when Kathy and I worked closely together, Kathy's guidance always seemed to be spot on. It was extremely impressive and she really helped guide us to get the vehicle uh, development complete, getting it tested and operated right. And really it was much more than a customer for us uh, during that phase of the program. Really was a partner in helping making us successful. That's so we could help uh, NASA be successful. And that's some of the really special things I'll remember about that program. So, you know, Kathy, as the first woman to be in charge of NASA's human spaceflight program, uh, I can't think of a better leader uh, in the mission to land the first woman and next man on the surface of the moon. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Kathy. Thank you, Frank. Um, thanks for the kind words. I, I look fondly on those two and I will tell you, I feel like every single one of those missions is still my mission. So <laughs> I was very happy to see NG-14 going up. It was, it was great. And uh, for a contract that started out with uh, our goal was trying to figure out, you know, how to get 20,000 kilograms up, you know, it's, it's really phenomenal. So um, very proud of you and your team and all the work that you've been doing. Um, along the way. So uh, thank you for having me here. I, I really appreciate um, uh, 13th annual uh, Memorial, Werner, Werner von Braun Memorial Symposium. And, uh, you know, we right now in HEAL are, are moving and turning our vision into reality in, in various stages. You know, um, Frank talked about uh, one place, you know, us having a vision in the late 20s, the late 2000s, um, 
you know, looking forward and saying, what do we want station to look like? And then that's what enabled cargo. Us moving into um, and having the vision on crew is what enables us to have the picture right here at the top of the, of the slide. And so we have more things and we have more visions that we are turning into reality. And, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, next slide. You know, this is, I know, a crowd pleaser. I wish I was in the room because every, there'd be a lot of people in the room that would be loving rockets. And, um, and we've uh, enabled uh, a multiple varieties of rockets with our visions. Um, but, but really what's very important is those rockets are enabling missions. And we are right now at the cusp of even more bold human spaceflight missions. Next slide. You know, we're also at the cusp of, you know, we tended to talk, I would say, you know, 20 years ago, we tended to kind of focus in a particular aspect of space, right? And, and I think what's so exciting about where we are now is we have strategic goals for low Earth orbit. Um, you know, we want to enable and lay and ensure there's a foundation for America to maintain a constant human presence in low Earth orbit. We've learned through the value of the, of the International Space Station what a platform in that region will enable us to do. Um, but we also, and, and it enables us to get ready for deep space. And so it's going to be important for us to be to use low Earth orbit to then help us then conduct human exploration in deep space. And, and we have goals for the lunar surface. We have goals for orbiting platforms. And all those goals are then getting us ready for our net and using it as our stepping stone for the next phase, which is eventually to go to Mars. Next slide. You know, Frank Frank talked about getting ready for a mission. And obviously, you know, we, we've we been flying cargo commercially for a long time. We're kind of at the beginning of really flying crew. Uh, we had a very successful crew demonstration mission, you know, with the launch and return in August. But coming up on crew one, and last night I was able to kind of break the news that, you know, we're going to be, Right now, we're headed to the range with on November 14th at 7.49 p.m. is, is the first, our first attempt for our Crew-1 mission. But this is really the cusp of us using U.S. commercial capabilities to deliver our crews to the International Space Station. Obviously, alongside our Russian um, folks that are have been uh, at, at an amazing, consistent, and reliable cadence uh, delivering our crews. And so um, this is a big, major part of us turning that vision into a reality, not just for SpaceX, but also us moving forward with our demonstration missions with the, um, the Dreamliner and moving forward to um, being able to um, conduct missions uh, moving forward on the on the Boeing vehicles also, but I love these kinds of pictures because this puts right in right in your face. Here's the people that we're holding in, and industry is holding in their hands to ensure that they can fly our crews safely to the International Space Station. It's a place where we're taking that vision that we had rolled out in 2010, 2011, and making it a reality today. Next slide. And it's not just in the commercial just crew aspect of it. We're also looking at how do we further use the International Space Station? You know, over the last 20 years, we've been figuring out ways to maximize the value of this beautiful lady there that you see. I mean, and one aspect of maximizing that value is with her being able to be a destination for not only our commercial cargo and crew people, but also on orbit for their, the science community and and anything else in industry that that we feel like would help the low earth economy. You know, we're also looking at is there ways to have the ISS be a destination 
for future private astronaut missions. Um, looking at all different aspects for us then to be able to be able to establish a robust Leo economy and eventually be able to buy for us to be able to buy services in Leo. You know, this is a very we know that we need a platform for us to be able to do our science and be able to check out our technology to get ready for the next steps in our human exploration program. Next slide. So it was really critical for us to then go start. We've been developing exploration capabilities for about 10 years now, and it's been very critical for us then to go use those capabilities to enable long-term exploration, right? The Artemis program will, will lead the humanity forward in our quest to be able to get us eventually to the exploration of Mars. You know, we are right now, and we're, if I could figure out how to not have a storm hit the Alabama coast again, or the Louisiana coast, um, I swear, five five storms this, this summer has been pretty brutal for us trying to get a, a stage tested. But when we get through this testing, there'll be one more piece, one last piece of our Artemis One uncrewed demonstration vehicle that will be do, conducting a mission next year. And I, I don't think when people talk about this, it is gonna be a huge rocket. And I know for this audience, having a huge rocket is key, but it's also gonna be an amazing mission. It's gonna be between four and six weeks long. It's gonna take us 40,000 miles beyond the moon. It's gonna be almost 300,000 miles from Earth at this stage. This is it's about what is really getting us from a mindset ready to go do exploration missions. Um, and so it's going to prepare us for our Artemis II mission, which, like the sh chart says, is our Apollo 8 moment. Um, it's when we'll be putting our crew members on this vehicle that eventually will be doing our exploration missions for us. You know, we, we are working through getting through the final testing and getting our last piece of core stage down to the Cape. Um, but it's through us having these hard missions out there that really enables us to move forward and push the technology to be able to conduct these missions. Next slide. So, you know, for the last 10 years, we've been establishing the key infrastructure to be able to get crew to our destinations. So the Orion, the SLS infrastructure, um, with uh, all the key partners that are building and delivering pieces of the SLS system. But we want to be able to go and stay. <laughs> Staying is very important, continuing to go, having numerous missions, not just going to go, but going to do. And so we've been working a very exciting day today. Um, we announced that our gateway MOUs with ESA was signed, and we're in the process of finalizing our other MOUs. Very exciting day, laying and taking advantage of the international cooperation that we've had on the space station and, and paying it forward for us to start and laying the foundation for our, our orbiting platforms. But even more important, we need to push forward on our goal to get people on the moon in 2024. And so the human landing systems that are that are being developed and the program being led at the Marshall Space Flight Center is working to get the working with three different companies to get those human landers going. That team has been um, you know hitting every milestone. In fact we're about getting ready to it's probably my last opportunity to even talk about the solicitation because we're heading into our our, our kind of final RFP phases looking at awards next spring. Major, major foundational capability that we're gonna need. We're gonna need deep space communication. We're gonna need to continue to have our crew transportation capabilities deliver consistent transportation for crews to these destinations, and we're going to need our commercial 
uh, gateway logistics complement to be able to support these key activities. Next slide. So we've got a lot of near-term milestones. I'm not going to go through all these, maybe just show them all at the same time, because I know um, if I went through each of them individually, it'd be really, really tough. You want to just go ahead and show them all? Yeah. So look at all. Look at, I, I jumped into a, uh, into a mission directorate that has a ton of work <laughs> on its plate. I mean, it's amazing to me what our near-term, the amount of near-term milestones that we have. You know, we, we're, you know, working on getting the first Blue Origin suborbital flight test. So we, we, that was accomplished, right? Went through that, able to, it checked out our, our um, the key uh, detection systems that we're going to need to be able to have our pinpoint landings, right? 20 years on space station. Tremendous. I already talked too much probably about Crew-1, kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, we're working through um, our free flyer habitability uh, selections, and I already talked about all the moving forward on not only the SpaceX crew mission, but also making progress on our Boeing missions. You know, Frank talked about NG-14, but guess what? There's a 15, and they'll probably, you know, there'll be other missions coming up, right? Many, many more to come. We're also, you know, SpaceX and Northrop Grumman are, are delivering cargo multiple times a year, but we, what we failed to talk about sometimes is Sierra Nevada's also working hard on delivering their capability. We're also working towards how do you establish the intergovernmental framework for us to be able to do work on the moon? The Artemis Accords is a key aspect of us. Um, another area where we're kind of, we're driving the system and, and establishing key um, infrastructure for us to be able to do our missions on the moon. We've got to get the, all the pieces down to the Cape and be able to conduct our Artemis I mission uh, next year. And, the, on the, and like I already talked about, next spring is a big year for us for the human lander, landing system um, procurement. Um, you know, our goal is to have two providers to be able to maintain competition and uh, we'll be working through and really counting on um, industries' ideas and and uh, um, and their proposals coming in to be able for us to be able to assess and and look at what kind of capabilities we'll be able to keep going. So just a tremendous tremendous amount of work. If you looked at all the swim lanes of the portfolio that we have going on with Keo, I'd, I'd probably be here talking for another two hours, so I won't do that to you. Next slide. But you know, none of this is easy. I think uh, I think we all know we're in the space business. Um, I think one of my, my uh, favorite Elon Musk quotes is, the way you become a space millionaire is start out as a billionaire. <laughs> because none of this is easy, right? We do these things because they're hard. And in NASA, we do these things because it's when you have a hard problem, when, like I say, big problems is what push you to, pushes us and forces the innovation. Give me a hard problem to go solve, and I'm going to have to come up with some creative solutions to be able to solve it. So obviously, we all know the technical challenges out there. You know, going and, and getting a, a mandate from the president to be able to go put boots on the moon by 2024, first woman and next man, um, that's a hard problem to go solve. And it's it's pushed us all to be able to go come up with innovative ways to be able to get us there. You know, we've got to really understand one of the key things, and it's why all the work that the science folks do for us and the space tech do folks do for us that enable us, that help us collect the data and the information and learn about the, the key science and technologies to enable us to be able to accomplish our goals are, are critical. And so, so 
like it says, space isn't easy to understand. We don't have all the answers. And for us to be able to know how we can safely um, maintain a human presence, we have to learn a lot of things to be able to know that the systems that we're building can safely protect those people. You know, cost is a major factor. Um, we are probably looking, we're looking at, uh, uh, we've been, well, since Jim, Jim's come in, we've actually had a, a, an amazing 25% increase in our appropriated budgets. But yet we've got a lot on our plate and we want to accomplish even more. And so really the way you do that is by doing what's on your plate, hopefully more cost effectively and, uh, and while being able to then use what we say for new content. I do feel like we're at the cusp that for us to be able to conduct our future missions, we're gonna have to figure out how to use, do our current missions as, as cost effectively as possible. We are open to any ideas anybody has for us to be able to do that without compromising the safety of, of our folks. And, as people know, I think politically we've had to work really hard to be able to make sure we got bipartisan, bipartisan support. And everybody here online has been helping us with that, right? We within NASA are hoping that our vision is your vision. And through that, we're able to ensure that the, that the nation wants to continue to make their investment in us. But, you know, like I like I talked about, when you have a big problem, there's always new problems coming up that you have to solve. And and that's part of kind of the fun of the business, right? Is it's, it's through those challenges coming up that then we're able to work through them and be able to kind of push the state of human learning and knowledge to a new level. Next slide. So what's really key for us is that we have a vision, right? And that we know what our what our purpose is. You know, our goal is to push the framework of human knowledge by us conducting these missions. And through us conducting these missions, we're going to learn in so many different ways from even from a legal framework, regulatory framework, um, all the things that us engineers tend to not think about. But when you're starting to talk about going to the moon, we're we're pushing the framework, right? So we are establishing these platforms that the whole agency can use, science can use. I'm hoping Jim Reuter in the Space Tech Mission Directorate can go figure out what are other ways for us to use these platforms to further leverage their goals along with us maintain a human presence and continuing to explore with people. We do dream big. You know, it's to us dreaming big that we ensure that we're not starting with a small goal. If we know how to do everything, we're not expanding the human knowledge. <laughs> you know, we've got to do things that we, we've got to say we're going to do things that we've got to figure something out to be able to go do. But we also have to understand that we have to work it within a framework to be able to and and be able to accomplish the goals realistically that are set amongst us. So all this takes, you know, it does take courage. It takes courage to explore. It takes courage to get on and, and go on a path that you don't necessarily know where you're ending up. And and understanding that the key aspect of this is the journey. It's the journey and the learning that we'll accomplish through that journey. Next slide. So I say this all the time, exploration is a team sport. You know, this is gonna take every single ounce of energy amongst all of us to be able to accomplish our goals, right? It's gonna take industry. You know, Frank talked about partnerships, we had to, for us to get to the cargo capability, it took, uh, for us at that time, about every ounce of energy for us working together, working together to be able to accomplish that goal. So it's going to take industry. It's going to take all parts of NASA. 
It's going to take our international partners. It's going to take our inner other agencies within the administration to be able to help us. It's going to take all of us wanting to push and pursue this goal. So we need your help. <laughs> we need your ingenuity. We need your ideas for us to be able to, to go accomplish our next missions and push us forward. Thank you. And I'm not sure I have time for a question, but um, I'm going to leave that up. One down. or two, Kathy, for one or two questions. Okay. Uh, this one is uh, obviously from somebody at Marshall. Hmm. Uh, question about SLS. What are the other uses for SLS other than for the human space flight? And are those uses scheduled yet or are they just postulated? Well, Right now, I mean, I, I firmly believe that if we develop a transportation system that's cost effective, there'll be other things that we can use that transportation system for. Um, but what's really key for us right now is to focus on getting our crew transportation system up and running. Because without a crew transportation system, I don't have any other transportation system to get my, my crews and to be able to do the critical aspects of the mission that we need to go do. But that doesn't mean that there isn't, and, and like we said before, I'm open to all ideas. If there's anything out there, if there's other uses for, for the, the rocket that enable us to be able to, to accomplish our missions as cost effectively as possible, I'm open to it. All right, and, and one more um, of several, but one more, and, and that is, you talked about crew one being in the middle of November. You know, back in the old days when I had a real job, our first nighttime launch of shuttle was a fairly dramatic activity, uh, not only because of the way it looked, but because of all of the different things you have to worry about when it's dark, as opposed to when it's light, such as downrange and crew abort and those kinds of things. Can you say a few words about what kind of things you're looking at doing maybe differently or you need to put together for the first night launch? So the team's been preparing for all kinds of contingencies, right? So obviously understanding where, you know, the time frame for the launches, there they're, we'll have, um, we've, they've been preparing for nighttime, you know, early morning uh, during the day launches. And so, the fact that we were able to get demo two off and be able to kind of prove out our systems was really, really critical for us. Um, and, and the team, it's, it's always that first one through, actually they've done it several times now, even with the, um, the other missions. So the same things that we have in place for the previous launches, we'll have it there. We'll have to understand visibility and the other things, but honestly, the spacecraft has the key aspects that, um, ready. This is always a, a tough call on when and, and what's the right time for us to be able to conduct it. But um, looking at the trade, we, we know that if you start looking at that ground track up the East Coast, as you move farther and farther and farther into um, the winter time frame, we start having a harder time with the abort ranges. So we got the team prepared. They're ready to go. They've got the right kinds of monitoring capabilities to be able to find the spacecraft. And uh, this is going to be an exciting mission. All right, Kathy, I think that'll be the last question. And thank you very much for your insight yeah. into these things. And um, I really encourage folks to go in and watch the archive video and pick up the nuances that you didn't pick up when Kathy first spoke or spend some time studying the slides. I'm going to download it set of the slides myself so that I can have those as reference. So thank you very much, Kathy. And Northrop Grumman. Thank you, Alan. Thank you again for being today's sponsor. Frank, thanks for coming in and, and being the spokesman for Northrop Grumman. And now we're going to take a break until 1.10 Eastern, 2.10 Central, and we'll come back with uh, some awards. So thank you all very much and enjoy your lunch break. <laughs>